Today on Destined to Win. The power of God's forgiveness is simply this. There's nothing, no matter how big, no matter how bad, no matter how wicked, no matter how twisted, no matter how evil, no matter how, how bent, no matter how hurtful, that can prevent God's forgiveness from flowing into your life if you are in Christ Jesus and repent of it. And welcome to Destined to Win with Pastor Frank Santora. Society's given the letter F a really bad rap. Think about it for a second. When you and I were in school and things didn't go so well, what did we get? We got an F. When tornadoes are categorized, what letter do they use? F. Not to mention the letter F is the beginning of a really naughty word. Today, Pastor Frank brings dignity and respect back to the letter F. So let's prepare our hearts as we listen to this message from our series, The Real F Word. Today I want to look at the power of God's forgiveness, listen carefully, to forgive any sin that anyone has ever committed. Any sin that anyone has ever committed. And I know when we hear that, it's kind of challenging for us to really grab hold of, because let's face it, in our humanity, we have set up something that I call the sin spectrum. The sin spectrum is where we place on this side the forgivable sins, and those are things that we consider the small things, like, for instance, lying, gossiping, not paying our tithe. They all go on the forgivable side of the sin spectrum. And, and really, when we consider them small, it's because they're, they're common. They're things that everybody does. And so in order for us to cope with that reality, we place them in the forgivable side of things, you know? If... if if other people do it and we do it and, you know, we know we're not going to really change in that area or strive to change in that area, just kind of part of human nature, boom, they're in the forgivable side. And then we go over here and we place in this category the unforgivable things. And these are the things that most people have self-control over. Most people are able to not fall into these things on a regular basis. And, and because they're, th they're those kind of things like murder and rape, and, and adultery, and drug use, and those kind of things. So we put them in the forgivable side, or the unforgivable side. And the reason why we put them there is because we kind of think that we're better than that. You know, we're going to do these things so they're forgivable. But, but these things, we can control ourselves. And, you know, the people that do that, and, and, and no condemnation, but this is just how human nature is. Well, they're degenerates, and so that's unforgivable. And, and we feel like that this stuff here carries with it the sentence of you're going to hell, and there's no way you can ever escape it. But this stuff here, no matter how many times we do it, or how many times we talk about people, or, or no matter how many times, you know, we, we stretch the truth or fudge on our taxes, ah, everybody does it. God will forgive me. It doesn't affect my relationship with God. So we set up this sin spectrum where on one side we've got forgivable things and on the other side we've got unforgivable things. And no matter how studied we are or how long we've been saved, we just buy into that, that that's the way it works in the kingdom of God. And as a result of that, we miss the power of God's forgiveness. And the power of God's forgiveness is basically this, that there's nothing ever said or done that is unforgivable. Nothing that anybody does that's ever said or done that is unforgivable. Except, of course, one thing. Right? There is one sin that if you commit it, you'll never be forgiven of. Okay? And I want to show you this in Scripture. Go with me to Mark chapter number 3, verse 28. Mark chapter number 3, verse number 28. I'm going to read from the NIV first and then from the message translation. The NIV says, all sins... And blasphemies of men will be forgiven them. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven. He's guilty of eternal sin. Mark chapter 3 verse 28. And the message says, there's nothing dead, 
nothing done or said that can't be forgiven. But if you persist in your slanders against the Holy Spirit, you are repudiating the very one who forgives, sawing off the branch on which you've been sitting, severing your own perversity, all connection with the one who forgives. And so we see very clearly from Scripture that there's nothing ever said or done that is unforgivable except one thing, and it's called blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. And without getting into a big theological uh, dissertation on what blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is, let me simplify it by just pointing a couple of things out. Number one, the job of the Holy Spirit is what? To point us to Christ, right? And so when you resist his pushing you toward Christ and into a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, you have blasphemed the Holy Spirit. And anytime you do not come into a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, any sin that you commit is unforgivable. But when you are in a relationship with Jesus Christ, every sin that you and I commit is forgivable. And so the only thing that can prevent you from staying in an, un, in a, in a, in an unforgiven state is simply rejecting Christ. That's what the scripture is saying here. And so the power of God's forgiveness is simply this. There's nothing, no matter how big, no matter how bad, no matter how wicked, no matter how twisted, no matter how evil, no matter how, how bent, no matter how hurtful, that can prevent God's forgiveness from flowing into your life if you are in Christ Jesus and repent of it. And that is the power and the beauty of forgiveness. But no matter how many times we say that, let's face it, it's still, I don't know if it kind of registers up here. And God knew that it, 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 we'd have a hard time getting it to register up here. And so what God did is he put this really bizarre, really crazy, really twisted story in the Bible to help us to understand forgiveness. How many of you know the Bible has some bizarre, crazy, twisted stories in it? I mean, I, I know we think that, you know, oh, I can't believe you said that about the holy word of God. The Bible has some twisted stories in it. There are times when I pick up my Bible and read that I wonder whether I, I just accidentally grabbed the wrong book from the shelf. Maybe, maybe I grabbed Reader's Digest instead of the Bible, you know. And, and there are certain times where you could think that you might have grabbed a, 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 a magazine that, that you shouldn't be looking at when you read the Bible. Like, have you ever read Song of Solomon before? I mean, it, it'll make you go, whoa, it'll make you blush. And, and there's one particular story in the Bible that takes the cake. It is the most bizarre story in the entire Bible, and it's found in the book of Hosea. Hosea chapter number one, as you're turning there, let me kind of bring you up to speed on this story. There was a time that uh, this man who was just in love with God with all of his heart, he was God's man, he was just, he was righteous, he lived for God. Um, he, was, he was God's prophet. He was living during a time when Israel had turned their backs completely on God. They decided to live by the way that many of us, or many people, I should say, in this world live today. And that is, if it feels good, just do it. I mean, isn't that what our culture tells us, that there really is no right and wrong, that what's right to you is right for you, but not necessarily right for me. What's wrong for me may be wrong for me, but not necessarily wrong for you. And, and how dare I try to impose my right and wrong on you? There is no standard, and so you, you live your life, and I live my life, and we just do and, and figure it all out in the end. That's how the culture lives today. And Israel was living that way. They turned their back on God, and if it felt right, they did it, and they, they strayed far away from God. And so God began to speak to this prophet by the name of Hosea. And he went to Hosea, and he said, I need you to go, and I need you to, to, to help me in getting Israel to come back to me. Now, you and I would think that what God would tell Hosea to do was to, you know, get a little soapbox out and stand in the town square and begin to preach about repentance and righteousness and coming back to God and, and you know, and judgment if it doesn't happen and, you know, just really preach a real strong message that maybe give an altar call, lay hands on some people, watch them go over, put little towels on them and have revival in Israel, right? But that's not what God tells them to do. What God tells Hosea to do is to go down to the red light district and to pick out a wife from amongst the prostitutes. You say, what, well, Pastor? Did, 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 did you really just say what I thought you said? Yep, this is the story that is in the Bible. It's found in Hosea. And it begins like this. God says to Hosea, check it out with me. Hosea, 
chapter number 1, verse 2, the Lord began to speak through Hosea, and the Lord said to him, go marry a promiscuous woman and have children with her. Literally, the word promiscuous means a prostitute. Have children with her, for like an adulterous wife, this land is guilty of unfaithfulness to the Lord. Now, I don't know about you, but if God told me to go marry a prostitute, I would start rebuking the devil. I'd be like, get thee behind me, Satan, and I, I know this can't be God. Some of you would be like, I hope God would tell me that, Pastor. That'd be awesome. Listen, <laughs> God, God is not telling you to do that. I can assure you God is not telling you. This is one of those one-time things in the Bible that God is doing in order to make a point. And so God tells um, Hosea to do this, and Hosea, processing through all of this, um, decides to actually listen. And he goes down, and notice God doesn't say, go pick you out a reformed prostitute. Go pick you out a repentant prostitute. Somebody that went to a church service and gave their life to Jesus and, and now is ready to turn over a new leaf. He just says, go pick you out a promiscuous woman, one that right now is practicing this kind of stuff. And Hosea goes down to the red light district, and, and he picks him out a wife there. Verse number three says, so he married Gomer, daughter of Diblam. And she settles down. They become a family. Husband and wife. Years go by. They fall in love. They have kids together. Three kids. The names of the kids are Jezreel, which means judgment. Lo Ruhimah, which means not loved. And Lo Amai, which means not my people. Great names for kids, huh? What's interesting is that Hosea's name means salvation. And so the message is this, that God is sending salvation to somebody who deserves judgment. That God is sending salvation to somebody who doesn't feel loved. That God is sending salvation to somebody who is estranged from him and not one of his very own. And when we analyze and ask ourselves the question, what is happening? The truth of the matter is that forgiveness is happening. A story about forgiveness, something that we can not comprehend because of our sin spectrum and the way that we have tried to analyze forgiveness is for this and not for that. God says, listen, here's what I need to do. I need to go to the pile of stuff that you call unforgiveness and unforgivable and I need to place that as front and center in the story so that you know that there is nothing that is ever said or done that is unforgivable. And so he pulls out a prostitute from the unforgivable side of the sin spectrum. And he says, she's going to be the center of the story. And the story gets even more bizarre. They, they get married. They're, they're living together. They have these kids. She's learned how to be a soccer mom. I mean, she, things are going great and, and everything's fantastic. When all of a sudden, she gets bored. She gets bored with commitment, and she gets bored with the same man, and she gets bored with, with being a soccer mom, and she gets bored with just, you know, doing the wife thing and the mother thing. And so what she decides to do is she decides to bolt, and she goes right back to the red light district again, and she's now on the, on the street, and she's selling herself again for two figs. And suddenly, his worst nightmares come to pass. She's not there anymore, and he's, God, how can this happened to me. And while he is kind of coping with this, he's learning how to get along and he's heard all the rumors that she's back on the street corners again and, and he doesn't want to believe them but he knows that he's got to move on and, and, and suddenly fast forward a few years, he's learned to cope and the kids have, 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 have learned to live without their mother and, and they, they have as normal of a life as possible but all of a sudden God decides to speak to Hosea again but this time God says something that really rocks his world. Hosea chapter 3 verse 1. The Lord said to me, go show your love to your wife again, though she is loved by another man and is an adulterer. He says, listen, I know she's left and I know she's broke your heart, but what I want you to do is I want you to go find her. And he says, what do you mean, God, go find her? Isn't one broken heart enough, God? We've just learned how to get on. We've just learned how to cope. And now you're telling me to expose myself and my kids again to this type of behavior and this type of lifestyle? God, I don't know whether I could do it. Nevertheless, because you've asked me to, I will. And he goes and he looks on every street corner and in every crack house. And he can't find her. Until he realizes she might be at the slave auction. See, Gomer has gotten old. And uh, her belly's not as tight as it once was. 
and um, the stretch marks from three kids, at least, are now showing. And she's got completely gray hair. And uh, she doesn't have the look anymore to carry out her line of work. And so she figures the only way that I can survive now is I've got to sell myself as a slave. And so she goes to the slave auction. And the room is very crowded and she's up in front. And in slave auctions, you had a parade in front of your potential buyers completely naked. This had never been a problem for her before, but, but now since she was older and not in the kind of shape she once was, she now feels shame and, and guilt. And she's standing there and she has her head down. And suddenly the bids begin. And, and the auctioneer is trying to get as much money as he possibly can. And the bids go as high as about 12 shekels. And, and, and he, when he sees he can get no more, he, he goes for it. Going once, going twice, going three times. And as he's around, about ready to, to hit the gavel down on the table and say so, sold, this hand in the back of the room shoots up and he says, I'll pay 15. She thinks, oh good, who's bought me now? Maybe this person is going to be a taskmaster. Maybe they're going to beat me. Maybe they're going to rape me repeatedly. I don't know what I've just gotten myself into. And the man walks up to the front, and she looks up, and she looks back down, and then she takes a second look, and she really, she really, oh, Hosea, is it, is it you? And he says, y yeah, it's me. I've come to buy you back again. Hosea chapter 3, verse 2, so I bought her for 15 shekels of silver and about an omer and a lethic of barley. And suddenly he looks at her and he says to her, you're to live with me, verse 3. Many days you must not be a prostitute or be intimate with any man and I will behave the same way toward you. What's going on? What a bizarre story. Why is a story like this in the Bible? Did God want to just test out the script for Pretty Woman, knowing that would be a Hollywood hit later on? Why is it in the Bible? It's there because God wants us to understand His forgiveness. And there are several takeaways that I believe that God would speak to our heart as we unravel what forgiveness means. And the first one is simply this, that we are Gomer and Jesus is Hosea. We are Gomer and Jesus is Hosea. We are the ones that were steeped in our sin. We were the ones that have gone astray. We are the ones whose heart has gone cold. We are the ones who are held captive by the vices of this world. We are the spiritual prostitutes that pimp God out every time we need something from him in our lives. We are the ones that deserve judgment. We are the ones that didn't deserve to be loved. We are the ones that are separated from God. We are the ones that have broken the heart of God. We are the ones created by him, given life by him, gifted by him, cared for by him, and who have turned our backs on God. We are Gomer, but Jesus is our salvation. He's the one that came after us. He's the one that offers us a second chance. He's the one who, who risked his reputation for us. He's the one who gave up everything for us. He gave up his throne, and he came to where we were. He visited the red life district known as planet Earth, and went to a cruel cross, and reached out his nail-scarred hand, and said, I I'll pay for them. I'll buy you back. We are Gomer and Jesus is Hosea. It's our story. Our story. In the story of Hosea and Gomer, she was purchased for 15 shekels. In our story, we are purchased for a much greater price. 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 18 says, knowing that you are not redeemed with corruptible things. Redeemed literally means purchased, it means bought back. You were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot. I'm not sure that we realize just how high of a price that verse is describing. The word precious here describes the rarest of rare. It means entirely unique. It means something you can't find anywhere else and something that is one of a kind. And because of its rarity, it is only supposed to be used on the most special of all occasions. I discovered, I did a little Google search on the 25 rarest things in the world. And these are the things that jumped out to me. I found that there is a, an iPhone 3GS Color Supreme Rose by Stuart Hughes. 
that is so rare it's worth $2.97 million. $2.97 million. I found out that there is a feather from a particular bird, and I don't know how to pronounce the bird, um, so I'll just spell it H-U-I-A. Um, one feather from this bird, $10,000. Imagine if you had the whole bird. Imagine how much that bird would be worth. A 1962 Ferrari, 250 GTO, because of its rarity, uh, $35 million. $35 million. Someone said, well, what can you compare the blood of Jesus to? Well, human blood, yes, but also divine. Human blood can be stored for up to 42 days, and then it loses its power. In over 2,000 years, the blood of Jesus has never lost its power. Human blood can carry disease but the blood of Jesus heals us from all our diseases. Human blood is red, just like Jesus' blood, but anything that touches the crimson blood of Jesus turns white as snow. A pint, one pint of human blood can save up to three lives. One drop of Jesus' blood can save the entire human race. The thought of human blood can make you squeamish, but meditation on the blood of Jesus will set you free. Spilt human blood reminds us of the ultimate penalty for sin, which is death. But Jesus' blood cleanses us from all sin and gives us eternal life. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. We are forgiven because of the price that was paid for us. Third truth that God wants us to see. We cannot earn God's forgiveness. Friends of Hosea may have asked, why in the world would you ever forgive somebody like her? She doesn't deserve it, nor did she do anything to earn it. Friends, that is precisely the point. That's the reason why the story is in the Bible. Because God wants us to know that you and I cannot earn God's forgiveness. We don't ever deserve God's forgiveness. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8 says, for it is by grace that you've been saved through faith. It's not from yourselves. It's the gift of God, not by works so that anyone can boast. We're not saved because of good behavior. We're not saved because of behavior modification. We're not saved because of penance or church attendance. We're not saved because of Christian duties or obeying religious regulations. We're not saved because we go to church on Sunday, attend a midweek Bible study, join a connection group, don't curse, don't swear, don't smoke, don't drink. We're not saved because we don't watch rated R movies. We're not saved because we don't do the same things that the world does. That's not what creates salvation in our lives. God's grace cannot be earned. All of our works are as filthy rags. God's grace can't be earned in and it can't be unearned away. It's undeserved, unmerited, unwarranted, unprovoked, unjustified, unfair, impartial, independent, and unprejudiced. No amount of good deeds can secure it and no amount of bad deeds can push it off. It has nothing to do with us and everything to do with us. Nothing to do with us because our actions don't dictate its availability, but everything to do with us because the reason why it is available is in the first place, is because of us. Gomer didn't earn Hosea's forgiveness. All she could do was receive it. Thanks so much for tuning in. We're so glad that you did. We pray that the Holy Spirit has ministered to your heart and challenged you. God's asking us a question right now, and the question is simply this. Have we downloaded the new OS into our lives, the operating system of forgiveness, are we still operating by the old system of unforgiveness that's easy for our flesh that says pay them back and get even and take revenge? That doesn't produce any lasting fruit in our lives. God wants us to operate by the system of forgiveness that he's offered to us through his son Jesus Christ. And maybe you've never made Jesus Christ your personal savior. Right now I want to give you the opportunity to do that. Would you say this prayer with me? Lord Jesus, I invite you to come into my heart. I ask you to forgive me of my sins. I repent of them, and I'll never be the same. With your help, I'll live for you for the rest of my life. If you prayed that prayer, the Bible says that you've been born again, you've been made new, 
that all your sins are passed away and you now have the capacity living on the inside of you to offer people the same forgiveness that God through Jesus Christ has offered each one of us. If you prayed that prayer, I wanna hear from you. I wanna know your story. I wanna know how God is impacting your life and touching your life through this ministry. And I just ask you to contact us, reach out to us using the information on the bottom of your screen. Right now, you're gonna hear a little bit more about our series called The Real F Word. When people wrong us, it's natural to want to get revenge or to hold it in quietly until it grows into a grudge. Hanging on to these offenses can steal our joy, destroy relationships, and even affect our health. We need to make forgiveness the basic operating system for our lives. The greatest way that we can be like God is if when we given the opportunity to totally hurt somebody who's hurt us, that instead of choosing to do that, we choose to bless them instead. Pastor Frank shares some powerful truths about forgiveness in this four-part series, The Real F Word. For your gift of any amount, we will send you a copy of today's complete message. Or you can order the entire series by digital download or CD for only $30. To request your copy of The Real F Word, visit us online at franksantora.cc or call us at 888-700-5262. It's time for you to release those who have wronged you and walk in the freedom of forgiveness today. If this program has been a blessing to you, I want to encourage you to prayerfully consider becoming our partner and supporting us financially on a monthly basis. We realize that there's a whole bunch of other things out there vying for your financial attention and other great ministries. And so right now I'm speaking to those people who feel a connection with this ministry, feel like God is speaking to their heart and asking them to partner with us on a monthly basis and help us to fulfill the work that God has commissioned us to do. If that's you, I want to encourage you to use the number on the bottom of your screen right now to use our website, contact us and say, hey, we want to become your partner. And as our way of saying thank you, we want to offer you our entire series, The Real F Word, absolutely free. Thank you so much for tuning in. It's been our pleasure to be with you. We hope you tune in next week, same time, same place. And remember this, with Jesus, you are destined to win. If you're in the New York City or Connecticut area, we invite you to visit us at one of our locations or join us online every Sunday at faithchurch.cc live. On behalf of Pastor Frank and from all of us at Faith Church, we love you and we'll see you next week.